I do still have this stuffed chimpanzee. Uh, he is in my bedroom at home. He's a bit naked now because I carried him everywhere. He was my very favorite toy of all. And all my mother's friends said, oh, you can't give a small child this terrible uh, creature. She'll have nightmares. But no, I love Jubilee. When I was a tiny little girl, I always loved animals. And we lived in the city in London. Um, we didn't have very much money. We couldn't afford a bicycle. There weren't many animals to really watch, but we shared a little piece of green garden with other apartments, and there were worms there. And of course, there's always in London pigeons and blackbirds and things like that. And so I looked at the animals I could. When we're born, as far as we know, we can't choose our parents. I don't think we can. We just have to make do with the parents that we that we get. And some of us are lucky, and some people are very unlucky. I was one of the really lucky ones, and I attribute almost anything I've done in my life that I'm even a little bit proud of to the wise raising I had by my mother. And I always like to acknowledge this, especially with young people who may go on to have their own children. But right from the beginning, my mother encouraged this love of animals. And when I say she was wise, when I was this age, she came up to my room one night and found I'd taken a whole handful of earthworms to bed with me. <laughs> a lot of mothers would, oh, throw those dirty things out. How dare you bring them in? But she didn't. She said very quietly, Jane, if you leave them here, they'll die. They need the earth. And so we gathered them up together and took them back into the garden. Then comes my first really vivid memory. I don't remember the worms at all, my mother told me. But what I do remember is when I was four and a half years old and we went to stay on a farm in the country. It was my father's family. And for an animal-loving little girl from a city to come face to face with cows and pigs and sheep was just so exciting. And I was given a job to help collect the hen's eggs. And there were no cruel battery farms in those days. And so I was putting the eggs in my basket each day. And you know, there's an egg, sort of roughly like that. Well, apparently, I began asking everybody, where is the hole on the hen where the egg comes out? <laughs> and I couldn't see one. And you could look for hours, and you wouldn't see one either. So anyway, nobody told me to my satisfaction. And I remember this day seeing this hen going up into her little hen house where they slept at night. And it was sort of three o'clock in the afternoon. I thought, ah, she's going to lay an egg. So I crawled in after her. Well, that was a mistake. And with squawks of, I suppose, fear, she flew out. And this is what I remember so well, thinking, only four and a half, thinking, this is now a frightening place. No hen will come to lay an egg here. And going into an empty hen house and waiting, hiding in some straw at the back, and eventually my patience was rewarded and a hen came in, I can still see that egg plopping out. And I can still feel the, the excitement I felt. And my poor mother, they, they didn't know where I was and it was getting dark. And, you know, they'd all been out searching. And she sees this excited little girl rushing towards the house. And she could easily have said, how dare you go off without telling us? Don't you know how frightened we've been? Uh, don't you dare do it again? Which would have killed the excitement. But no, she sat down and listened to the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg. She found books for me to read when I was learning to read about animals. She thought wisely, if Jane is reading books about what she loves, she'll learn to read quicker. Then when I was around somewhere between 10 and 11, I found for myself a book about Tarzan of the Apes. Now remember back then there was no TV. We still didn't have much money. World War II was raging across Europe. We couldn't afford new books. But second-hand bookshops I loved. And I found this little book about Tarzan of the Apes. And of course, I fell in love with this glorious lord of the jungle. And what did he do? 
he married that other stupid wimpy Jane. <laughs> I was extremely jealous. So anyway, um, that was when my dream began. I will grow up, go to Africa, live with animals and write books about them. Well, everybody laughed at me. How would I do that? I've already said we didn't have any money and that war was raging. And Africa we thought of as the dark continent, not because of the color of the skin of its people, but because it was dark with mystery. And worst of all, I was a girl, and girls didn't have that kind of opportunity in England in those days. So everybody laughed at me and said, Jane, get a real dream about something you can achieve. But not my mother. She would say words to the effect, if you really want something, then you must work really hard, you must take advantage of opportunity, and above all, you must never give up. So that was the that was the atmosphere I grew up in. I don't think anybody in my house ever told me there was something I couldn't do because I was a girl. And when I left school, just about all my friends went to university, but we couldn't afford it. Couldn't get a scholarship back then unless you were good in a foreign language. I've already said I could never learn them. Um, so again, it was my mother. She said, well, why don't you do a secretarial course? Then perhaps you'll get a job in London. So I did that. I was working in London with a documentary film studio, learning a lot. I wasn't even being a secretary. And then came opportunity. A school friend invited me to Kenya, where her parents had moved. Couldn't save up money in London. Went home, worked at a hotel around the corner as a waitress. Saved up my wages, saved up my tips. And back then, just after the war, you know, you really didn't get much money being a waitress, and it wasn't a fancy hotel where people drop in for romantic evenings. It was just a hotel where people came from up in the north of England for a week's holiday, and they weren't going to give you a big tip because they didn't have that much money. Of course, I made sure everybody knew I was saving up to go to Africa, <laughs> so my tips were probably bigger than they would have been. But anyway, eventually I had enough. So I was 23 years old, when I waved bye-bye to family, friends, and country, and set off on this amazing adventure. And you know, I find life is an adventure. I find that every day, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who you'll meet. You don't know what you'll learn. But even so, that first adventure, sailing off on that ship, because it was cheapest in those days, that was something very special. And I stayed with my friend, and I got a job in Nairobi. And that was when I met the next person who had such a big influence on my life. This is Louis Leakey, famous anthropologist, paleontologist, spent his life searching for the fossilized remains of early man. Somebody said to me, Jane, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Louis. So I went off to the Natural History Museum. And he, I can remember him asking me so many questions about the animals there. And because I followed my mother's advice and I'd continued learning about Africa and animals, spent hours in the Natural History Museum in uh, London, I could answer many of his questions. And so he gave me a job, his secretary. You see, my wise mother, she fitted me for all of this. He gave me a job in the Natural History Museum. And that led to him giving me this extraordinary opportunity to study not just any animal, but the one most like us. And it actually took a year before I could start that study, because there I was, a young girl, straight out from England, no degree of any sort, who was going to give money for such a crazy adventure. Well, eventually, a wealthy American businessman said, all right, Lewis, here's money for six months. We'll see how she does. Ah, now I can go. I was waiting back in England this, all this time. But no, there was another problem. Back then, what we call Tanzania today was still part of the British colonial empire. It was Tanganyika. And the British authorities were absolutely not prepared to take responsibility for this young girl. But in the end, because Lewis never gave up, they said, oh, all right, but she must have a companion. Who came with me for the first four months? That same amazing mother. So there we were, two English women in a very remote part of Tanzania on the edge 
of Lake Tanganyika, the shores of Lake Tanganyika. And we, the, 